Good morning. How you doing this morning? Man, I, I leaned over to my wife after that last song, and I said, I don't, I don't know why I'm preaching today. That was kind of the sermon in a nutshell, because that was, wow. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, um, but uh, this is not part of my sermon, so you get like two sermons. Um, God is not in the business of making bad people good. Um, God is in the business of making dead people come alive. And uh, I know for a fact there are people in this room who need a resurrection in their life. Um, and so if, if that's you, um, you've come to church, and, and you are technically breathing, but you feel dead, uh, you, you showed up in the right spot today because uh, we serve a God who is in the business of resurrection. And man, and if I didn't believe that, I would not be doing this job. I mean, but, but I do this job. I'm a pastor because I believe that God still, still today, thousands of years later, is in the business of resurrection. And I, and I hope that you believe that uh, as well. I want you to just imagine with me for a moment, and this is going to take a little bit of work, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Um, you have a friend of yours, okay? A friend of yours. And that friend of yours is making all of the exact same choices that you are making. Now, if that friend was making all of the same choices you were making, would it give you a pause? Would you pause for just a moment and just think, hmm. Like if, if your friend, let's say it's your coworker. Your coworker makes roughly the same amount of money that you make. And you, you know they make roughly the same amount of money that you make. But, but let's say that coworker spent as much money as you spend. Let, let's say that coworker just bought everything that they possibly could buy. Would you look at that coworker and be like, huh, I, I, wonder, I wonder how he's doing that. I wonder how she can afford that. I wonder how she's making ends meet. Like if you looked at another person, a friend of yours, making all the same choices that you, as you, would he give you pause? Would you just think, huh, that, something seems off there. Or maybe this, what if a friend of yours had the exact same internet browser history as you? Would it give you pause? Would you think, Whew, if that person's spouse knew, their marriage would probably be in trouble. Like, just the same one as you. Would it give you pause? Would you hesitate? Would you look at them and think, there's just something not right there. Like if they had all the same stuff as you, would it give you pause? Or maybe this one. And I, I don't want to hit too close to home for you, but um, what if a friend of yours drank as much as you drank? Like what if, what if a friend of yours drank as often as you drank? You, you know, because your friend... Back in college days, they drank, and it was with everybody else. It was with the fraternity. It was with their brothers. It was with their sisters. They had a good time, um, and then they got into business, and, and then at the business parties, they would drink. But this friend, the drinking didn't stop after the parties ended. The drinking continued, and it continued, and it continued. If your friend drank as often and as much as you drank, would it give you pause? Would you just think, that's a little bit too much. That's, that's a little bit too often. Would you just hesitate a little bit? Because here's the thing. It's very, very easy for us to see when other people's lives are about to derail. Like we can see their train going off the tracks. I and mean, we can see it very quickly. We see the signs. We know what's happening. And then we might even try to have a conversation with them conversation might go something like this, like, hey, I've seen how much you work, and I've seen how little you're at home, and part of me wonders if, if you're working way too much at the expense of your family, to which they would say, man, I, I got deadlines, I got things I got to do, I got, I got projects that got to get done, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, and so it's just a season, I'm, I'm not forever busy at work, it's just a season, but you know better, right? You know when you look at your friend's life, that busy season at work isn't just a season. It's become a lifestyle. It's become a habit. Or maybe you try to call your friend out on drinking. 
I mean, you understand, you might have a glass of wine with them at dinner, and for you it ends with just a glass of wine. But for them it doesn't end with a glass of wine. It ends with another glass, and another glass, and another glass. And you've tried to say, hey, maybe you need to cut back a little bit. Maybe you need to think about how much you drink. And it's so easy for you to see that this life that they're living is going to derail eventually. But as soon as we bring those things up, they laugh it off, they joke it off, it's no big deal, it's no problem, I got it under control, it's not a big deal, I could stop at any time. I mean, you know, you've heard all the same excuses. But let me ask you a question. And this is a tough question. What if that somebody else isn't just a somebody else. That somebody else is a you. What if you're the one with the habit? What if you're the one with the problem? What if you're the one with the issue? What if you're the one with the addiction? What if that somebody else isn't just a somebody else? It's not just a coworker, it's not just a friend, it's not just a family member. What if that somebody else is you? I know, at least from my own life, and I can only speak for myself, I know that I'm really good at holding a magnifying glass up to other people's lives, but I'm really bad at holding a mirror up to my own. Right? Isn't that how we are? We're really good at just holding a, a magnifying glass up to their life and seeing all of their flaws. We can pick out all of them. We know every single one, we know every single bad habit, we know every single addiction. I mean, we can point it out. We know it. But then, putting a mirror to ourselves and examining our own life, out of the question. That's too hard. So if you'll give me the grace, extend me the grace to hold a mirror up to your life, and, and give you a question that the answer will determine if there are some habits in your life that are out of bounds. And here's the question. If anybody, if two people have ever come up to you and they've told you, Ben, I'm really concerned about, insert a problem in your life. And it's happened more than once by more than one person. If you've had people come up to you and they've just, you know, timidly and shy, but they've just tried to, to kindly say, hey, I'm, I'm really concerned about you in these couple of areas. I mean, you fill in the blank. You know what it is. I don't know all of your issues, and the fact of the matter is you probably hide it from all of us because church people are good at one thing. It's, it's hiding stuff. <laughs> you laugh because you know how true it is. And if you've had multiple people come up to you with concern, saying maybe you have a problem, then let me lovingly say, you have a problem, whether you want to admit it or not. But let me give you some good news. The good news is that the resurrected king can still resurrect me and can still resurrect you. So even if you do have that habit, even if you do have that problem, it doesn't mean your story's finished being written. It doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't mean it's done with. There's a chance for redemption. Now, as I, as I finish this message, I want you to know um, this is not some self-help talk to try to put your life into order. This is not some kind of TED talk that maybe you watch on YouTube. Um, this is not some self-help book that you're gonna get you know, at Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or whatever. This is not one of those because here's the thing with self-help books and all of those other things is that they rely upon you as the center of willpower. And, and I don't know if you've realized this yet, willpower runs out. It lasts a little bit, but it runs out. And so today, this message is rooted in the word of God because it's the word of God through the power of Jesus Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit in our life that actually produces real lasting change. 
So this isn't just, this isn't just a self-help talk, and I, and I hope you don't get that. I hope you get that whatever habit it is you're going through, it's through the Word and through Jesus that your life will ultimately find change. So if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, um, will you please turn to uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 is where we're going to be. And before we dive into this uh, sermon, uh, before we dive into the scripture for this, uh, we, we are at the end of a two-week series called uh, You'll Be Glad You Did. And, and the whole idea for all of this is that we have a series of decisions in our life, we have moments in our life where we can look back on and we can either say, I'm glad I did, I'm glad I changed, I'm glad I fixed it, I'm glad I was different, I'm glad I went back and, and changed that relationship, I'm glad I did, or we can look back on those series of decisions and we can just say, man, I wish, I wish I had. I wish I'd changed. I wish I'd listened. I wish I'd done differently. I wish I'd fixed that. And so today, whatever habit it is that you're going through, whatever struggle it is that you're dealing with, um, you're at a crossroads. And years from now, I want you to look back at this message and, and have it as, a, as a, a marker in your life where you can look back and say, I'm glad I did. Like, that's the day where I'm glad I did. I'm glad I changed. I'm glad I started to be different. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 starts like this. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Now, this verse, while you've probably read a verse like this or similar verses like this uh, throughout your church life, if you've been going to church for a while, um, this particular verse is, is just, it's the foundation that our house rests upon. Okay, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to break apart some words and phrases from this verse before we move any farther ahead. And, and the first is this word believes. Believes. Belief, belief, when we, when we view it through the, the, the New Testament lens of Jesus Christ, belief is not a passive activity. It's not just like we, we believe it happened, we believe there's things that exist. It's not just that. Belief is a life-altering action. It fundamentally changes who we are. Our, our belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior changes every aspect of our life. It's not just this passive thing where we just, yeah, I, b I believe in Jesus. I mean, Jesus would th say things like, who cares if you believe? Even the demons believe and they shudder. Like, who cares that you just have this belief? Belief isn't rest upon passivity. Belief is action. It's a life-altering action. And then this word Christ, this word Christ, um, every time you read that word in the New Testament, I want you to, in, in your mind, replace it with Savior King, with Savior King, because that's the embodiment of that word. That's what that word means, is that Jesus is the Savior from our sins, and he is the King, Lord, leader of my life. Like, that's what I'm fundamentally believing. Like, that's what, that's what it all hinges upon, is that I believe that Jesus wasn't just another good guy. I don't believe he was just a good teacher. I don't believe he had some really cool things to say that would help people. I, I mean, those things are true, but what I fundamentally believe is that the only Savior, the only Savior of the entire world is Jesus. And not just is he the Savior, he's the King. Like, that's what I believe. I mean, this is central to, to the Christian message. The Christian message is, man, I need a new Savior, and I need a new King. And then that phrase, born of God, just means that I get a new identity. I get a new family. Like I, get, I get a whole new outlook on life. I'm invited into this kingdom of God where he is king, and I get to live with a bunch of other people and do life with a bunch of other people who they believe the same thing. That they believe it's all our call in life to follow Jesus King. And, and our identity is wrapped in him, not in our own. Now, before we dive into your habits, the corrections you make in your life, how you need to change things and move things around and adjust them to fix it, um, 
Let me ask you a question that, that is more important than anything else I can ask you today, and this question will determine the trajectory of your life. And the question is this, which king do you follow? Which king do you follow? Because listen, all the time where you've decided to be king of your life, you've seen where it's left you. It's left you a cold, dead sinner in need of a savior. Like when you're king of your life, your life derails. Which king do you follow? Which king do you follow? Because if you really want to change the habits in your life, if you really want to do things differently, if you really want to find lasting joy, then the answer to this question needs to be King Jesus. Here's the difficult part, though. I can't answer this question for you. Like, I am accountable to God for this answer in my own life, but I cannot answer this for you. Which king do you follow? Verse 2 and 3 say this, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Maybe you never do this, but sometimes when I read scripture, I kind of want to push back against it and be like, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't, I don't know if I think that's true. And, and I thought that when I first read, and his commandments are not burdens, burdensome, because I don't know if you've tried following Jesus lately in our world. It seems a little difficult at times. I mean, at least for me, maybe, maybe you've got Jesus thing figured out and you're, you're perfect. But for me, but for me this, I thought, man, sometimes they are a burden. Sometimes they are really challenging. But then I stepped back for a second, and I reflected on what does this mean His commandments are not burdensome, and, and here's what I thought. Just imagine with me, that thing, that habit, that repetitive series of choices that you are making in your life, the choices that have brought shame and regret and guilt. Just imagine with me. Just imagine with me, it was gone out of your life. It was no longer there. That, that God, through the working of the Holy Spirit, removed that from your life. Gave you the ability to make new choices. Gave you the ability to develop, develop new habits. Just imagine with me if God did that for you right now. Wouldn't it feel like there's been this weight lifted off of your shoulders and you could breathe again. <sighs> like it's not burdensome. Now then, just imagine with me a world, and I understand this is utopia and we can't bring this about, but, but for, for just a moment, just imagine with me a world where nobody in this entire world struggled with the poor choices that you have with the bad habits that you bring to the table. Nobody in this entire world struggle with that. Is our world better? Right? It is. It is. So when he says our com his commandments are not burdensome, it means that when we faithfully follow King Jesus, he lifts this weight off of us, and he gives us new life and new energy. Verse 4 says this. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. Everybody say victory. victory. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, this particular word, victory, is used one time in the New Testament. It's used one time in the New Testament. And, and it's, it's a conjugation of another word that's used in other spots. But this word, victory... Is, is a word that is actually very common in our society, but this word victory, um, it, it's a word that was used to describe a Greek goddess, a Greek goddess. And, and this was the Greek goddess of victory. And the Greek word is Nike. 
The Greek word is Nike, and so Nike was the Greek goddess of victory. And once Rome, once Rome conquered uh, Greece, they adopted all of the Greek gods and they gave them new names. And this, this goddess of victory um, became a prominent figure in all of Roman society. I mean, everybody that was reading this, all, all the people that read um, in John's audience, they would have understood this word Nike, and then they would have understood what all it meant because um, um, Nike and the, the Greek goddess Nike which turned into the Roman goddess, it was all over the place. There was, there was a, a picture uh, of the Greek goddess of victory on the coins. There was a statue that was in the Senate Hall with the goddess having one foot planted on top of the world. And, and all of this was a symbol of Rome's power. And that because Rome had pleased the gods, Rome had victory. Generals, would fly banners of the goddess of victory as they came back from war. Now, you heard the word Nike. The way you pronounce the word in English is Nike. Like you always thought it was a check mark. It's actually the winged feather of a Greek goddess. That's why Nike's slogan is just do it. You can accomplish, you can have victory. I say that while I'm wearing Nike gear. I understand that. I still love Jesus. Okay, calm down. But this word victory, this word victory, John's saying it has nothing to do with this pantheistic gods who are somewhere up there. It has nothing to do with that. The reason we have victory, true and lasting victory in our life is because of our faith in our Savior, King Jesus. And that is the only thing, the only thing, hear me, the only thing that gives us true victory in our life. The way we overcome things is not by our own individualistic willpower. I can just grit it out, get it done. I can change it. The way we overcome things is through the saving work of Jesus Christ. And our belief that the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead can bring a resurrection into my own life. That's, that's what gives us Nike. That's what gives us victory. Verse 5 says this. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So which one of you in here with a bad habit, with an addiction, with a series of repetitive poor choices, which one of you can overcome those? Which one of you can change those in your life? It's the one who believes that Jesus is king of all, but not just all, Jesus is king of me, and Jesus is king of you. So to wrap this message up, I want, I want to get really, really practical. Like we've been kind of hovering at the 50,000 foot level for a minute, and now I want to get really practical into um, how to break out of the poor choices and the poor habits that you have been involved in for maybe years and years and years. And the first step is this. The first step to, to changing those habits is, is number one, um, you have to have a desire to change. A desire to change. Now, I understand that seems obvious. Okay? I get that that seems obvious, but um, just by nature of my, my job as a pastor, um, I have people often who come discuss with me uh, just, just poor choices that they're making in their life, and it ranges the gamut. ranges from poor choices at home, to poor choices with finances, to poor choices at work. To, I mean, it just ranges the gamut. And I, I almost always ask the same question when people come to me with, with personal issues and personal bad habits, and this is the question that I ask. I always ask this question, do you actually want to change? Do you actually want to change? To which, inevitably, every person always says, well, yeah, of course. And then the obvious follow-up comes up. Well, you know if you change, and you want to change, that means you have to do things differently. And that's the point where most people stop. Like, I want to change. I want to be different. I want to not have this in my life. 
but I also don't really want to change my habits or lifestyle very much. And, and as Christians, as, as Christians, we, we call this desire to change. It's this kind of church word. It's called repentance. It means that I've been going in this direction with my life, and I want to turn around and do things differently. I, I literally prayed this for you this morning in my, in my car on the way to church. If you're in here, and there is somebody in here, I know for a fact that you are struggling with a bad habit with a series of poor choices. I have prayed that God bothers you, that God doesn't let you sleep well, that God lets you feel guilt, that he doesn't let you run from those things, that he bothers you at your core until you know for a fact you have to change. And I understand we're supposed to be in a society where it's all love and it's all hugs and it's all feel goods, but sometimes the most loving thing that can possibly happen to you is for somebody to say, you need to wake up and change your life. What you're doing is wrong. And if that's you, if that's you, and you're in here, and you're in here, just pray that God bothers you. Like really bothers you. Like tonight you can't sleep well. Like tomorrow all day is just running in your mind i got to fix this. i got to change this. i got to be different. Like, I want God to bother you. Because you're not fixing this habit until you have a desire to change. The second step is you've got to be willing to be authentic. Willing to be authentic. Without a willingness to be authentic, change is not going to happen in your life. If I could categorize our, uh, the relational status of our society this way, I, w I would say it's this. We are the most connected generation in all of history, and yet we've never felt more alone. We've never been more connected in our entire lives. Like right now, you could go online and you can see what all of your family is doing in all over the country and maybe even in other countries. Like you could go online, you could see it. You know what's happening in their life. You saw their Facebook post. You saw their status. You know what's happening. We've never been more connected in our entire life. And yet loneliness has never been higher. And then you couple that loneliness with the idea that poor habits and poor choices and a series of bad decisions develops this shame and guilt to where we were already lonely, but then we just isolate ourselves and we insulate ourselves from everyone else. And so while we might want to change, We've isolated ourselves so badly that we don't even know where to turn to for help. We don't even know where to go to. We want help, but we've pushed everybody else out of our lives. And all that's left is just me. Now, I, I, I need to say, the, the beauty of being a Christ follower and having a true Christian friend, a true Christian friend. Now, like real, authentic, true Christian friends, th those are small in number that we have in our lives. I describe it like this. Jesus had 72 disciples, and he had, he had all 72. They were following him. And then he also had 12, which he was closer with. And then Jesus had three, which he was really close with. And so our real, true Christian friends, it's a small circle of people. But those real, true Christian friends, it's a group of people that we can trust, that we can be authentic with, and that we know that in our authenticity, grace will be extended, but not just grace, and not just a hug, and not just it's going to be okay, but also loving truth that we need to hear. And the friendship is resilient to withstand it because you know the friendship is built upon the love of Jesus Christ. 
mean, that's what true Christian friendship looks like. And maybe you don't have that in your life. Maybe that's just not a part of your life. Well, can I tell you? We're launching small groups in a few weeks. We're launching a men's ministry. We have a win- women's ministry that goes on. We, we have small groups for every age. We have a Celebrate Recovery ministry. There are places for you to find people who you can be authentic with. But I can't, I can't choose for you to get into a group. I can't choose for you to go on Friday night. I can't choose for you to surround yourself with other people. That's up to you. It's up to you. And so you need to have a desire to change. You need to have a willingness to be authentic. And the last is you need to find a loving community. I'll often tell teenagers, um, like, peer pressure is bad. If you can think back to, like, middle school or high school, peer pressure is bad, right? You, you tell your kids that. You tell your grandkids that. Like, peer pressure is bad. And, and in fact, um, you know exactly what a teenager is going to be like in a year or two if you just see who they're hanging out with. If you see, if you see who their friends are, you know who they're going to become. Now, the opposite is true as well. There is, in fact, for sure, bad peer pressure. Do you know there's also good peer pressure? Like you surround yourself with some incredible, positive, God-fearing, Jesus-loving people. You know what starts to change in you? You start to become a God-fearing, Jesus-loving person. So if, if you're struggling with a habit, with a choice... You know who you need to surround yourself with? You need to surround yourself with a community of people who have gotten past where you're gotten, you've gotten, and they can have the grace to walk with you as you get to where they are currently. Like if you struggle with alcohol, if you struggle with alcohol, you should find some of our CR leaders who have been sober for years and years and years by the grace of God and through the community of Celebrate Recovery. And you should surround yourself with them You should get in a group with them. You should find a loving community. Now, at this point in the message, if I ended here, if I ended here and I didn't go anywhere else, all this is is your own willpower and secular humanism. Okay? If you don't know what that is, look it up later. But what makes all of this happen? What makes all of this possible? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the center that holds all of this together. And without the cross of Jesus Christ, without that, none of the other stuff matters. Because the cross is our constant, eternal reminder of where our poor choices lead to. Your poor habits, your repetitive bad choices, your addiction, the thing that you're going through, it leads you to death. That's where it takes you. But come on. The story didn't end on a cross. The story ends with an empty tomb. And so just because your choices lead to death, that doesn't mean it's over with because our king, our king Jesus, demonstrated and showed that death is not the final victor because through Jesus Christ, through the saving work of the Lord, through the saving work of the Holy Spirit, resurrection is possible. So if you've come in here, bad habits, addictions, struggles, I don't know what it is, but through the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross and through the power of the resurrection, you can have new life. You can be made brand new. You want a fresh start? You want to start over? You want to fix those habits, those addictions? Today's the day you can do that. The empty tomb is always a symbol that the Lord can give a resurrection to anyone at any time, no matter what they've been through. So can I pray for you? Can I pray for you to experience a resurrection? 
Heavenly Father, God, will you please, there's a person in here, there's people in here who, who need you. They need your resurrecting power. They need victory. They need victory over the addictions and the habits and the choices, whatever they may be. God, they need new life. And I pray that you will, will give them all of the strength that they need, all of the help that they need. Lord, you are the God of resurrections. Demonstrate that today. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, I need you to know that if some of this resonated with you and you're like, I need to find my community, um, our Celebrate Recovery Director, Sarah Burton, is going to be at a table right over here with all sorts of information about Celebrate Recovery, and she would love to welcome you in. Sarah is a fantastic woman of God who loves the Lord with all her heart and loves that community, and I'm telling you, it's a great community for you to get plugged into. So if you, if you need a new community, that's a community that is ripe for you to show up and to experience the saving work of Jesus Christ. And also, if you need prayer, um, we have prayer partners up front who would love to pray with you. They'd be honored, be privileged to pray with you. For everyone else, don't forget your tithes and offerings on the way out. Um, we love you. We'll see you next week.